Um, I mentioned earlier uh, that you have to encode stuff for HDR. It's a specific way you put it together. There's two main methods right now uh, that are out there. One is SEMPTE 2084. The other is uh, not quite standardized except in Japan. It's called HLG or hybrid log gamma. And the difference with hybrid log gamma is it's basically the television signal where they've extended the highlight range to be a log scale, so it goes straight up and up and up and gives you all of your highlight detail as an extension of the standard video signal. So if you take HLG and put it on a standard television, it's gonna look like normal video. You're not even gonna notice that it's different. Um, there's several other proposals, Philips and some others have uh, been talking about uh, ideas they have, but these two are more or less the both uh, the one on the right has been standardized in Japan and is being looked at by the EBU and DVB in Europe. And uh, the one on the left is the SEMPTE standard uh, so far. So all these standard comp uh, standards organizations, more acronyms here. <laughs> ITU is the important one, International Telecommunications Union. It's all of the national delegations from all the countries around the world. They're meeting every couple months about HDR in particular and trying to sort out uh, what the worldwide standard should be, and then a lot of these other things will then try to catch up and, and come in line with that. Um, a subgroup within ITU is called the Joint uh, Coding Task Force for, for Video Coding, uh, which is also a joint venture with MPEG, and they've been investigating the impact of high dynamic range in compression. So they're looking at you know, what happens when you take a high dynamic range signal that's a lot more detailed than you had before. You still wanna use the same compression technologies like HEVC or MPEG-4. What happens? What's the best way to encode? How can they make it work faster or better for uh, signals like 4K? And this becomes important because internet downloads really live off of compression. Without compression, we wouldn't have as many of these uh, TV shows you can watch at home. And they've gotten a lot better, if anyone's noticed in the past five years, the leaps and bounds improvements on watching content uh, over the uh, internet. Another uh, big factor is a group called the UHD Alliance. It was just formed in January, uh, literally the week of CES. They announced their creation. It's um, studios, manufacturers, Sony, Samsung, Panasonic, Netflix, Intel, and NVIDIA, uh, they're looking at basically the branding and collation of all of these ideas into hopefully a single user identifiable um, product level as a sort of called profile one of the first generation of HDR. So that when they put out this spec, they'll say, if you want to sell a set, it's called HDR with our logo, the, you know, the UHD Alliance logo, then you're guaranteed a minimum performance of whatever their specification is. And because otherwise, there's a little fear that there's gonna be chaos among all the manufacturers producing widely variant capabilities and selling theirs as the, the best because they have like 10% more black or something. So this is trying to set a sort of a consumer facing uh, set of specifications. The DTG UHD forum is uh, out of Europe has a lot more and, and more smaller companies, including almost all the encoding companies that make video encoders. Um, it includes the same big names who are on the other uh, organization. This one, uh, this group is, was initially, DTG was responsible for the digital rollout of digital television in Europe. And this is a follow-on forum about UHD, which is 4K largely, and now they've also had to jump into HDR. So they're looking at um, you know, how do they interoperate with HDR and they're much more involved in interoperations testing and sort of a very practical hands-on, how do we get equipment that satisfies the different signals that are gonna be available in both SDR and HDR. Um, in fact, they have literally a week from now, they're doing a big 4K interoperation test among a large set of these manufacturers. I think 20, 20 different folks are participating to show that they can receive, transmit, process, 
uh, 4K H UHD signals. So, what is UHD and why is it different? Well, the way things are going, it's not different at all. HDR looks like it's just going to be rolled into UHD as an option. So they're not going to talk about HDR as different sets and UHD as one type of set and HDR as a different type of set. If you're going blind with all these acronyms already, I apologize. <laughs> it's hard for me to even say them straight without stumbling. Um, but in essence, UH HDR is going to be an enhancement. 4K, UHD is 4K. They're going to add in HDR to that. There's some talk about, well, we can't leave HD behind. So HD will also get some HDR enhancements. So you can have HD that's HDR. You can have UHD that's HDR. Yes, it's going to be difficult to track. So, so this is a SEMTI group. Um, I know some of you might just be visitors, but uh, I wanted to at least give a one person's view of the range of things that are not figured out yet. So even though you're going to be able to buy an ultra Blu-ray player and hook it, hug it, hook it up to a 4K television and perhaps see 600 or 1,000 nit HDR this Christmas for a low, low price of only six or $7,000, that's the early, early adopters, of course. Um, yeah, some, somebody has to be first and they always want to pay more. So that's what's going to happen this year and perhaps even next year. But I wanted to uh, just mention some of the discussions that have happened uh, and been going ongoing about how do we deal with some of these engineering problems that have not been fully resolved. One of them is, is a common peak white needed? Video had 100 nits. Uh, we used all kinds of nits around 100, but 100 was the standard and mostly that's what people did. Um, do we need a standard now? Does it need to be 2,000 nits, 1,200 nits, 1,000 nits? Some of the set makers will say just 400 nits because that's about all they can make. Um, we don't know. And what happens if you have a video system where the peak weight can be anything from 400 nits to 4,000 nits? What is that going to mean for mastering, making content? Nobody wants to have to make one version for 400 and another for 4,000. Uh, we want to run everything off the same master. And that's a problem that has not been figured out yet. Uh, another question is, there's been preference studies where people like brighter and more color. It's like you look at stuff and you say, yep, brighter's good, more color's good. But if you're sitting there for two hours, or the average viewer watching five hours a night of television in HDR, the, every time something really blindingly white comes on screen, your eyes are going to react. And when it goes off screen, your eyes are going to react again. After five hours of that, do you consider that to be a comf comfortable viewing experience? And how bright does it have to be before you really get annoyed that it's too bright and everybody reaches for the brightness knob and turns the TV down? Um, still to be determined. Um, another issue is set makers can't make these whites except for very small parts of the screen. So there's already a, a technical spec for this Ultra Blu-ray that I'll misquote it if I try to say it, but it's something like no greater than 400 nits for 10% of the screens for no longer than this amount of time. And so if, if the set tries to produce more whites, like you look at a sky and the camera pans up and it's all white clouds, what's going to happen is the set is going to automatically turn on a power saver and it's going to drop the white in half. And you're going to see that. So all of a sudden you're panning up and all of a sudden the whole scene goes dark. And that's the TV set trying to save itself from burnout. Because a lot of these technologies are producing so much power and heat to get that much brightness that the sets could be damaged. And obviously, they're not going to let that happen. So they're going to have power limiting in almost all HDR sets to prevent that. But you're going to see it in your content sometimes. I don't know how often. Depends on how careful people are when they're making the uh, masters. Um, questions about what happens when the guys in live production start showing HDR. Um, things like live sports, in the sport, uh, football stadium, left-hand side of the stadium is in bright daylight, the right-hand side is in shadow, you're showing it live, camera's panning, you know, and then they put in a bug saying, coming next, you know, how bright does that bug have to be? Because it has to be seen over the bright daylight side and over the dark side at the same time. 
Um, not sure what's going to happen there either. We're all aware of the problem, not sure how it's going to be handled. Um, if you have an HDR player with uh, Ultra HD and you only have an SDR set in your back room, are you going to be able to play these HDR discs on the conventional sets? Can you just plug the same wire in and get a good looking standard video signal out? That is up for debate. Everybody knows it's desirable, but it's actually not that easy to do. Um, color volume remapping techniques. Wow, that's really technical, but it's how do you take a color gamut of Rec 2020 and squeeze it? I'll show you a slide later of what that really means. Uh, is content dependent metadata needed? We're doing a standard for it. Do we wind up needing it or is it something that can be bypassed? Hard to say. Signal identification issues across the ecosystem. Um, so video signals go everywhere. I mean, yes, in the home, they're very controlled because you pick it up off the internet and you send it to your TV, you're done. But out in the production world, you're piping them over wires, you're putting them in files, you're copying them to disks, and all that stuff has to know what version of video do you have in these files. And then lastly, uh, you know, we're going to need efficient displays that still ma meet mandated power limits for television. California has them, Europe has them, um, and yet we want the TVs to be as bright as we can to get the signal to look better. So there's going to be a trade-off here. Certain things are going to save us there that I'll talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> so this is all really far away stuff, right? I mean, no, it's Christmas. You can buy these sets today, more or less. Um, there's a couple that will be shipping at Christmas, some that you could buy today on the website. Sony, you can buy two of their six models today. The rest you're going to be able to buy in November. Um, this is actually also out of date because they just keep announcing new models almost every week. Um, and uh, they just keep growing. It's a growing list. So I want to I go off track just for a second. Um, when I was looking up certain things about those sets, I came across a couple interesting pictures. I hadn't really considered, how do they make all these panels? And this is one of the machines they use to make them. It's, uh, on the right-hand side is an uh, auto loader for big sheets of glass. In the back is a vacuum uh, robot that picks up and moves the glass around internally so it doesn't get exposed to dirt. And on the left is a, the main workhorse here is a, a vapor plasma deposition uh, system that etches and places all the materials and coatings on the glass so it can build up the electronics. And once that's done, the robot pulls it out, puts it in the autoloader, the machine comes up and takes it away. That machine is, weighs 250 tons. A factory would have dozens of them. And to get the scale right, you can see sort of there's a little chair and a little thing in front of the yellow there. There, It's about 14 meters square on each side and can make 90,000 panels a month. So here's the piece of glass that would fit into that. It's roughly three by three meters. It can make six 70 inch displays. Somehow I don't think those cardboard cutout guys are actually holding up that piece of glass. I could be, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so. Now, all, the, that same sheet of glass can make 18 40-inch panels. Um, so you start considering 90,000 sheets a month times 18 panels. This mach one machine can make a lot of uh, panels. Now, of course, they also, this is a corning slide, because they're they're really making an awful lot of glass for all of our TVs, and they do it in a way that I didn't expect. Rather than doing what you think, factory, you know, they make some glass, they ship it to the glass manu manufacturer. No, they don't do that. Corning builds a little factory right next to every big electronics factory, and they make their glass right on site, attached to the robot system, so all they gotta do is take it out of the Corning mill that makes the glass, the float glass, they cut it, they ship it right into the assembly line, and uh, they do this for almost all the major manufacturers. And what everybody's trying to go to, which Corning has been talking about, is they have a new type of glass for coating they call willow glass. It's bendable, it flexes. And what all the manufacturers are really hoping for, instead of having to make sheets of glass that are three meters square on each side, 
They want to make a big roll of nothing but glass, like you know the old newspaper print things where you had these huge rolls of newsprint that would go through machines. That's what they want to do in the t television manufacturing, and it's going to happen in the next couple of years. Uh, the cost is going to go down a lot because they're just rolling this glass through, they're coating it. Uh, they're hoping to use things like inkjet printers to put you know, OLED material on this glass. They can do a lot of you know, tricks, and you know, that's why these sets are becoming really cheap. And you can buy TVs for $200, because the manufacturing is like on an exponential, more efficient every year, even though the cost of the plants is going up, you know, just like semiconductors, a billion last year, two billion next year, four billion in a couple of years. Another thing uh, that's a big development is uh, quantum dots. Um, quantum dots is a um, new technology that's already showed up in your sets and you probably don't even know about it. Um, it's a, uh, <clears throat> to dive into physics for just a second, it, it's called quantum dots because if you go back to your physics lessons and recall that if a, uh, an electron is excited and it moves into a higher state, then when it collapses, it sends out a photon of light. Well, the quantum dot using microelectronics, light's wavelength is about 400 nanometers. If you build a little box that's less than 400 nanometers, maybe, maybe 300 nanometers, then you're going to actually force that electron to only go between certain states and only make a certain color. So the reason they're called quantum dots is because they're actually small boxes that keep colors at certain uh, specific color wavelengths. So you can see here a sample of only five. You can make hundreds of specific colors by this sort of containment process. And once you have them, this is a version of quantum dots that they call collo colloidal because it floats in liquid. You could print them as they do on the right. Take a little drop of a quantum dot and put it right on an OLED, and you're going to have a very specific color coming from that OLED. That isn't happening yet. Instead, what people are doing is they're putting the colors into sheets, so it's part of the backlight. They design the color space exactly the way they want it. Uh, and there's also edge lighting backlights that have these OLED materials in it, or uh, sorry, quantum dot material in it. And all of those are happening uh, very actively right now. Why is there such a big shift? They're not only cheap to make, you can not only just mix some chemicals, there's a video online where you mix some chemicals together and shake it and then at exactly the right moment you stop the reaction and it turns a certain color. And a chemist can do it. So they're very cheap to make, they're very colorful, you can get pretty extreme colors. And as far as set makers are concerned, they can save 40 or 50% of your power demands for a display. So that's really driving a lot of the adoption of quantum dots. Lasers are also real now, finally. Um, they're certainly showing up in film projection and cinema. Uh, there's probably 100 laser projectors planned for deployment in the next year uh, all around the world. China in particular is buying a lot of them. Um, but they're also going to be uh, useful at laser diodes within sets uh, for certain types of environments as well. So, um, but they're much more practical now than they were just a few years ago. So. That was a quick blast through the technology of HDR. And hopefully I didn't lose too many people along the way. But I think I'll take a, st a stop just for a second to see if there's any questions. Because you should all be spinning around right now. Like, what? <laughs> all, all I heard was $6,000, not for me. I don't know. <laughs> so obviously, th this is a little bit of the same problem as everybody heard about with 3D stereo. Okay, we got all this great technology coming our way. What are we doing about content? How are we going to see anything? We're going to have these nice, great sets that are really bright, but if we don't have HDR content, you're not going to be able to tell much. So right now, there's a lot of work going on at the studios to fulfill that demand. It's probably not a secret to people to find out that Blu-ray didn't actually do as well as anybody had hoped. Um, collectors still buy it. It's still a great quality medium. But the massive amount of purchases that happened with DVDs never really made it into the uh, Blu-ray world. And so uh, there's a real interest in, can we deliver the top quality product for all of our content, movies and otherwise, at 4K, high dynamic range, wide color space, 
the best looking package media you've ever seen, playing back at 100 megabits a second, uh, which is a compression ratio that nobody's really been able to deliver, um, except through package media. And so there's a lot of work going on right now, dozens of titles across all the studios for finishing in literally a couple months. Uh, and then they're looking at how do we mass produce thousands of these from our old libraries. How do we take our DCPs that we already made for the past 10 years and just convert them into HDR? There's a couple technologies. Uh, Technicolor has one called intelligent tone mapping, which takes existing content and tries to just spark the highlights up a bit. You know, just automatically figures out where the highlights are and just pushes them. And there's other, uh, other things people are looking at as well. You know, looking, film is already an HDR medium. So if you had good film scans that had a nice negative, slow uh, negative S-shaped curve, and you can pull another four or five stops of detail out of highlights in most film negatives. So if you go back to scan your old library one more time, you can get a lot of HDR content out of those, uh, those scans.